Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service this morning. It is great to see you all and great to be here with you. And if you are here for the first time this morning, then a particular welcome to you. I hope that you can come here and feel comfortable and welcome. There's no need to, to stand up or sit down at any point unless you absolutely want to. The main point of us coming together today is because there's something in us all that says I need to connect back into the God who made me and who loves me and who gave himself for me. And so if how you can engage with things this morning allows you to do that, then that's great. So let's just be here, be comfortable, be welcome, because we're not only welcomed by me standing here and by each other, but we're welcomed by God. Isn't that great? Do you know, the maker of the universe says, I want to meet with you this morning. And that's just brilliant. Welcome to everybody who is here in the building, whether you're in this bit or whether you're over in the family room. Hello, good morning to everybody in there. Got a few waves coming through. And welcome to you if you are joining us on Zoom or watching this later on YouTube. I'll be honest, we have got a few technical challenges this morning in the sense that Mark, who normally runs our tech from the back of church, is currently self-isolating at home. And so through the wonders of technology, Mark is there. He's not in the Priory Chapel, um, but he is, he is at home and he is running everything from there. So just bear with us this morning as we try to work out how that actually works in the context of this building in this time, in this place. Okay, so bear with us. Just on a practical note, if you haven't signed in this morning with the uh, track and trace QR code, then there are track and trace forms on your seat. So please just fill one of those in and leave the sheet and the paper in your pew and it will be collected for you at the end. In terms of our service this morning, as we have been doing and provided it doesn't start raining at some point, uh, we will be starting our service in here and then for our closing uh, couple of songs of worship, we'll go outside um, so that if you want to, then you can join in with the singing because we're still not allowed to sing indoors. Okay, and I am delighted that this morning we have Laura who will be preaching helping us to look at God's word together and to see what that means for us and to help us hear God's voice to each one of us. And also, I am equally, if not more, delighted to have Debbie with us, uh, who is going to be presiding over communion for the first time, which is brilliant. So, Debbie, huge congratulations on your priesting last night. I know that well, every, oh, here we go. I know that everybody here would have wanted to have been there with you for that and to celebrate with you in the cathedral. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that. I hope you got to watch it on YouTube. If you haven't, I have emailed out the link so you can catch up with that. Um, but it was just a real privilege to be with you in that service and to see that um, and to be part of that amazing moment. And I just... As we begin, I just want to remind us of some of the words that were spoken at Debbie's priesting last night by the bishop. These were part of the words of gathering, which came at the start of the service. And they say a lot about what Debbie has signed up for, but actually they some, say something about us as well. And so I just want to, to read these. So listen to them and think, well, what, what does that mean for me? So this was the bishop at the start of the service where he said, God calls his people to follow Christ and forms us into a royal priesthood, a holy nation to declare the wonderful deeds of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church is the body of Christ, the people of God and the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. In baptism, the whole church is summoned to witness to God's love and to work for the coming of his kingdom. To serve this royal priesthood, that's you lot as we believe in Jesus, okay? A royal priesthood, come on. To serve this royal priesthood, God has given particular ministries. Priests 
are ordained to lead God's people in the offering of praise and the proclamation of the gospel. They share with the bishop in the oversight of the church, delighting in its beauty. You're beautiful. Isn't that great? Delighting in its beauty and rejoicing in its well-being. We come together because it's good for us. We're part of the church because it's good for us. Priests are to set the example of the good shepherd always before them as the pattern of their calling. With the bishop and their fellow presbyters, they are to sustain the community of the faithful by the ministry of word and sacrament that we may all grow into the fullness of Christ and be a living sacrifice acceptable to God. So yes, Debbie, you have been priested, but in your priesting and as you come to lead us, we are also renewed in our calling, in our calling to grow into the fullness of Christ and to give ourselves to God in Jesus, in the power of the Spirit again. So do you know what? Go back and have a look at this. The bishop probably read it better than I did. But this is important because Debbie's priesting is not just about Debbie. It's about us. It's about the family of God, all of us together as that royal priesthood called to serve God in the world. So, but that said, it is brilliant that you've taken this next step and can't wait for you to celebrate communion for us today. I'm going to read some words now from uh, one of the Psalms that is set for today, Psalm 9. And it says this, the Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. We come seeking God today. And you know, this is a good place to find God. It's not the only place, but it's a good place. And we come with that promise that God never forsakes those who seek him. We can come together and meet with God today, not because of what we are going to do, but first and foremost, because of God's gracious kindness in his promise of his presence with us. You, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Do you know, if we come with that heart today saying, God, I want to meet with you. Maybe I don't know what that looks like. Maybe I've done it thousands of times before. God is faithful. God will meet with us. And so in a moment, we're going to join in some of our opening words that are going to come up on the screen. And in this, we're going to have a moment of silence. And I just want to invite you to use that to speak to God at that point and just say, God, please come and meet with me. So this morning, we come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us recognize his presence with us. As God's people, we have gathered. Let us worship him together. And so we're going to join in this uh, prayer of preparation together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
down to you In your kingdom Broken lives are made new You make all things new Cause when we see you We find strength to face the day Thanks to all in our family room as well for musical accompaniment coming from there. It's great. It's great. So as we come into the presence of God, as we turn our eyes to him, we, we get a glimpse of God and we get a glimpse of God's holiness and we acknowledge that in life we fall short of God's holiness, of what God calls us to in life. And so we take this time at the beginning of our worship to sort that out with God, as we need to do with any relationship, any friendship. We say sorry, we give and receive forgiveness, and we're renewed and we can start again. And that's the opportunity that God gives us freely through Jesus. And so we're going to join in with our prayer of confession, which is coming up on our screen. as we bring ourselves and our need for forgiveness before God and as we receive his forgiveness. And so I invite you to join with me in these words. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And so may God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Savior, forgive you your sins and make you holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we're going to join together now in the special prayer for today, the Collect which talks about God having broken through all of that sin and setting us free to serve him in the world. And so let's join together in these words. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and have sent the spirit of your son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to turn to look at God's word together now as we have uh, two Bible readings. Sue will bring us the first and Laura the second, and then Laura will come and help us to uh, apply those 
uh, Bible readings to our lives. So Sue, if you'd like to come forward for our first reading. Romans 11, 25 to 36. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godliness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his calls are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. On the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable is his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel is taken from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, Father, we pray that by your spirit you would speak to each of us this morning and fill us afresh with your love. Amen. So when I first thought about this passage in Mark's Gospel, I thought this was a story about answered prayer because the disciples turn to Jesus for help and get an answer that is so far beyond what they are expecting that they are afraid as a result. Who is this that even the wind and waves obey him? It could be, but if you look carefully, the disciples aren't asking Jesus for help. They wake him up to say, don't you care if we drown? It's not clear that they are expecting him to do anything, maybe help bail the boat, but the core of the question is, don't you care? Which is a really unfair question to ask someone who fell asleep before the storm even started. But it shows where the disciples are coming from. Jesus, asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat, is just too darn comfortable. They want him to feel what they're feeling. But that's what Jesus doesn't do. Jesus isn't afraid of the storm. He just tells it to shut up. And by doing so, he shows the disciples and us a bit more of who he is. Because there is lots of imagery in the Old Testament about God's power over the natural world. As an example, Psalm 89 verse 9 says, you rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. And Jesus has just told the waves to be still, and they have stilled. He hasn't asked his father to still them. 
He's just told them himself. One of the most important prayers for Jews begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And yet here is Jesus doing exactly what God does. If you thought the Trinity was complicated, here the disciples have to get their heads around it for the first time with no helpful vicar or YouTube videos. No wonder they're asking questions. And I'm sure that some of those questions are really uncomfortable because some of the disciples are fishermen. They know from long experience what the sea can do. They have just seen evidence that God can still a life-threatening storm, but not every storm has been stilled. And that's a real question. And the truth is that I don't know the answer to it. And I have to have faith that God knows what God is doing. And it isn't wrong to ask for help in a crisis. It isn't wrong to ask God to make his presence a bit more obvious either. But the disciples were asked, where is your faith? Because they had already concluded that they were drowning. And they didn't ask for help. They just asked, don't you care? And God does care. But that can be really hard to remember because that's not always what it feels like. Sometimes I have to hold on to faith in my head while my emotions are going absolutely haywire. Never mind a ship in a storm, I have literally had a full panic attack on a punt in two feet of water. And yes, that was embarrassing. And I'm sure that is a better metaphor for my entire life than I would like. But I'm still here and I do still have faith. And that faith is in Jesus who cared enough to die on a cross. The disciples didn't drown, although they felt that they would. But, and this is a spoiler on Mark's gospel for those of you who hasn't read it, Jesus actually will die on a cross, but that won't be the end. He will rise again to new life. Some versions of Mark's gospel end when the women find out Jesus has risen, but they say nothing to anyone because they are afraid. But Mark's gospel exists and that story is in it. So eventually they did tell someone. Eventually they got there. Eventually their faith did prove stronger than fear. And eventually these disciples who are so scared now will be so faithful that they can face even martyrdom. Even this story, even though it's really dramatic, is only a tiny part of a much bigger story. And that's where the reading from Romans comes in, because it tells part of that greater story, that even when things appear to be going decidedly wrong, God still has a plan. And that plan will eventually extend mercy to all. Left to our own devices, without the insight that St. Paul has here, we see things in terms of human lifetimes, but God is much bigger than that. So St. Paul is able to say that even what appears to be disobedience to God is part of a bigger plan and will be met with mercy in the end. God allows bad things to happen. He even allows us to be disobedient, but he doesn't leave us stuck forever. In the end, God is merciful, which is all well and good, but disobedience does have real consequences for people. The Christians in Rome are suffering persecution. Christians have already died for their faith when Paul writes this letter. Do we actually want God to be merciful when this happens? I'm going to digress slightly here, though not as much as you might think and tell you the story of Jonah, which you might know already, but bear with me. Jonah was a prophet. He was told by God to go to Nineveh, 
which was a famously sinful city and just happened to be the ca capital of a nation who were ruthless enemies of the Jews, Jews like Jonah. So he duly got on a ship heading as far in the opposite direction as possible. While he was asleep in the boat, a storm blew up. It threatened to swamp the boat. Sound familiar? The captain woke Jonah and asked him to pray to his God to see if he could stop the storm. Meanwhile, the sailors drew lots to try and work out who had annoyed the God who had brought the storm down on them. And this lot fell on Jonah. So at this point, Jonah came clean and admitted that what he was doing was running away from his God and advised the son to throw him in the sea. The sailors are not particularly keen on throwing someone into the sea, but eventually the storm gets so bad that they do it. And as soon as they do, the storm stops and everything is calm. Jonah, meanwhile, is swallowed by a really big fish or a whale, gets three days inside the fish to think about it, and then gets vomited up on dry land. At which point God tells him again to go to Nineveh. And this time he does, but he still doesn't like the Ninevites. So he walks through the, the city, gives his message that God is angry with Nineveh, and then settles down outside the city in the hope of seeing some righteous smiting. But there is no smiting, because Nineveh does repent, and God forgives Nineveh. At which point Jonah, the man of God that he is, is peeved and berates God, and it turns out that the whole reason he resisted going to Nineveh is because he knew that this is what God is like. God is way keener on mercy than Jonah is. And in the book of Jonah, the last line is God's. Should I not be concerned about that great city? The story of Jesus in the boat is written to have parallels with the story of Jonah. There is the obvious parallel that both manage to sleep through a storm and need to be woken up to give it their attention. But Jonah is traveling to get away from God's purposes. Jesus is traveling away from the Jewish part of Galilee towards a Gentile area. But the calming of the storm reveals that this movement from the Jews to the Gentiles is within God's purposes. And what the passage in Romans is saying is that God has mercy for all, Jews and Gentiles, and a plan for their redemption. God's mercy includes all those who are not quite like us, even those who we might prefer to think of as quite beyond the pale, even our enemies. God cares, in fact, far more than we do. And the more we are like God, the more we will care too, the more we will desire mercy rather than smiting, even if we think at the moment that smiting might be justified. Now, today is Father's Day, and some of you may know that I don't have a good relationship with my father. I am, in fact, afraid of him. So if I'm honest, I don't like the way this sermon is going because we have a God whose plan ultimately includes mercy for all, a gospel story about holding on to faith even when we are afraid because, because God does care and God is able to do amazing things even when we are too afraid to ask for them. And I've managed to introduce a prophet who needs to get over himself and brings God's message to the people to whom he is sent even though he thinks they are beyond the pale. God is a lot more forgiving than he is. Well, maybe when I put it together like that, you can join the dots for me. Wish me luck. But no matter what happens, whether it goes well or badly, God still has a plan. And it's way bigger than I am, way bigger than any single human lifetime, and far too complicated for us to grab more than the outline. But it's up to each of us to follow our call and play our part, having faith that God's mercy finally will not fail, not for us, 
and not for anyone. The Lady Julian of Norwich, a medieval mystic, put it like this, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And I've heard this paraphrased as, it will all be okay in the end, and if it's not okay, it's not the end. So take courage and know that the scariest of waves won't overwhelm you or won't overwhelm me, won't overwhelm any of us totally. All shall be well. Hold on to your faith. Amen. Thank you, Laura, for sharing that with us. Just struck by those, those words from, uh, from the end of Jonah, should I not be concerned about that great city? Is God not concerned for each one of us? Such that Jesus goes to the cross to die for each one of us so that we can receive God's mercy. Amazing. We're going to have the chance to respond to this now using the words of the creed, which will be coming up on the screen, which gives us a chance to say, this is what we believe. This is what we understand of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit. And so I'd invite you, if you'd like to, and are able to, to stand as we join together in the words of the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd now invite you to be seated as Mal comes to lead us in our time of prayer. Uh, let's pray. Father God, you always maintain your love for us. Jesus, you have mercy on us all. None of us has fully understood the mind of the Lord. No one has been your counsellor. You alone are of absolute power and absolute wisdom. All of us are dependent on you, God. You are the source of all things. It is your power that sustains sustains and rules the world. Father God, be with us when we face difficult storms in our lives. Help us to rely on your understanding and not our own. Whatever our difficulty, help us not to worry and panic. Help us to confess our need to you, God, and then to trust you to take care of us. Help us to see your power applied to our own situation. Help us to remember that all have received salvation through faith in Christ and that we have a role in Christ's future kingdom. As your people, we won't be discarded. God chose the nation and he has never rejected it. He also chose the church through Jesus Christ and he will never reject it. He continues to offer salvation freely to all. Father God, we pray for your church. We ask, Lord, for your protection over it and that 
you, Lord, continue to grow it, bringing us to spiritual maturity so that we may go out and proclaim the good news throughout your kingdom. Father God, we see the brokenness of our world and we pray for healing among the nations, for fair shares of the coronavirus, uh, corona vaccine, for food where there is hunger, for freedom where there is oppression, for joy where there is pain, that your love may bring peace to all your children. Father, we pray for our primary school. We also pray for the staff who work hard, so hard diligently for the children and all the governors and for Greg. Father, give them strength and energy as they lead the community school. God of life, we ask you for healing power on those who are enduring pain and illness. Especially we think of David, Adam, Keith, Eileen, Joe, Jessica, Mike, Anna, Richard, Stephen, and Jill. Lord, we thank you for our families today. We particularly pray for Natalie, Melise, and Felicity, for Kay, Siren, and Alexandra, for Paul, Heather, Isaac, and Eve. May your peace be with them all. We pray and give thanks for the continued recovery of Jean and Arthur. And Lord, we pray for spiritual blessings and new beginnings for Keith and Rosie, for Shirley, Mark and Debs, and for Charlie. Father, we share the grief of people close to us who have recently lost loved ones. We especially think of the family and friends of Jean and for the family and friends of Andrew. Lord, may they feel the presence of your love and comfort for them. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we thank you for our communities and the work of the Oak Community Project. Lord, open our eyes to the needs of those around us. We ask that you give us the heart to serve you and ask that you fill us with your spirit to bless us, to do more for your community and for one another. We thank you for the joy of human love and for all those among whom we live and work. We especially pray for those among our friends and families who do not know you, whose faith has been shaken. Help them to see that we have an anchor that keeps the soul sure and deep in the Saviour's love. We pray for all in leadership. We ask that they are guided by your spirit and seek the needs of those whom they serve. We pray for our leaders here at Christ the King, for Paul, Debbie and Laura, and our church wardens, Jill and Dot, and for Denise and the work that she does in your community. We ask, Father, that you continue to guide them, that they pray, that they seek your counsel daily. We also for Bishop Mark, as he prepares for his enthronement on Saturday. May he and all who attend be blessed by your presence and filled afresh with your spirit. God of creation, you hold the depths of the earth in your hands. You are closer to us than the air we breathe. Fill our souls with your love and light. Give us strength and courage to reflect that love in the light in the, and the light in the world. Father God, we pray for Debbie and her family. Lord, we ask you give her a deep faith, a bright and firm hope, and a burning love that will increase in the course of her servant life to you. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father God, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Bet none of you have realised I could be quiet for longer than that, could you? <laughs> Sitting there thinking, wow, that's an experience. Deb's been quiet. But um, before I share in the piece with you, can I just um, thank you all for those of you who have prayerfully supported me, not just last night, in what was quite a long service. So well done on persevering for a lengthy time on YouTube, but who've also prayerfully supported me and my family for the 11 months we've been here now. So well done. You probably deserve some sort of celebration far more than I do. But would you please stand because we are going to share the piece together. Now, apologies in advance for anyone who does use sign language as a way of communication if any of this is currently offensive. So I'm going to explain what our signing is for the piece before we actually share it. That is, if I've watched Paul correctly over these coming months. So we're beginning like this with our fingers together and our, 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 the rest of our fingers wide apart. And we're going, peace, be with, our hands are coming together and with you. Okay, I reckon we've got this. So... <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. We meet in the name of Christ, and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Peace be with you. Please feel free to share the sign of the peace together. During my time on retreat these last few days, we spent a lot of time in silence and a lot of time reflecting on what it means to be at this table, not just as a priest, but as a child of God. The privilege of what it means to share in this moment with all of you. So before we begin our communion prayers, would you allow me to share these words with you from a poem or a song by John Bell? Take this moment, sign and space. Take my friends around me. Here among us, make the place where your love is found. Take the time to call my name. Take the time to mend who I am and what I've been and all I've failed to tend. Take the tiredness of my days, take my past regret, letting your forgiveness touch all I can't forget. Take the little child in me, scared of growing old. Help me here to find my worth made in God's own mold. Take my talents, take my skills, Take what's yet to be. Let my life be yours, and yet let it still be me. If you'd like to join in the words of communion, the responses will be in bold on the screen. Would you please stand for a moment? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. Please take a seat. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this praise of sacrifice and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And we continue in a state of prayer as we pray as our Father taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. We say together, Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We say together, Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> 